John saw a city that could not be hid. John saw a city. Oh, yes, he did. John caught a glimpse of the golden throne. Tell me all about it. Go right on around the throne. He saw the crystal sea. There's got to be more. What will it be? I want to go to that city he saw, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I want to walk your streets that are golden. And I want to run where the angels have trod. Jerusalem, I want to rest on the banks of your river. In that city, the city of God. John saw the lion lay down with the lamb. I want to know everything about that lamb. John saw the day but did not see night. The lamb of God, well, it must be the light. He saw the saints worship the great I am, crying worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. I want to go to that city he saw, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I want to walk your streets that are golden. And I want to run where the angels have trod. Jerusalem, I want to rest on the banks of your river. In that city, the city of God. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, sing for your night is o'er. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna forever, forevermore. Jerusalem, I want to walk your streets that are golden, and I want to run where the angels have trod. Jerusalem, I want to rest on the banks of your river. In that city, the city of God, the city of God, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of God, the city of God, the city of God, Jerusalem.
Amen. Thank you, Kenny. I hope that you're looking forward to that Jerusalem someday. Well, I'm going to ask if you will in your Bibles find Acts chapter 16. We're still studying our parables, and as you remember, we're studying a couple of parables, and then we're trying to see from the book of Acts how the early church applied the, the truths, the principles, if you will, that we learned from those parables. And so uh, we have recently studied a couple of parables on uh, the spiritual receptivity, and that is how, how people will receive God's Word and, and what you can expect. And, and we studied the parable of the king's banquet, and, and people gave excuses. They didn't come. Uh, and that's what we experience in our lives. A lot of times there's always excuses. Last week we studied about the children who were playing in the streets and, uh, and nobody could be satisfied. Nobody, could, nobody would come into agreement and they accused John the Baptist of, of being a separatist and Jesus of being a, a glutton and a wine bibber. You know, nobody, nobody can be satisfied. They're, they're refusing to receive the, the message is, is basically what we learned from those parables. Well, this morning we're going to study a lady named Lydia. And what we're going to learn, though, even though the majority may not receive, there's always going to be a few that do. And what I want us to see this morning is what a difference one person can make. You win that, that one person, and, and the entire households can be changed. People can come to know Christ. And, and so instead of becoming discouraged over the fact that many do not accept the message, the promise is there will be some that will hear it. And those people can make a huge difference. So we're in Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read beginning in verse 11. So if you're with me in Acts 16, 11, please stand for the reading of God's Word. And we read it together uh, out of respect uh, for Almighty God Himself. So verse 11 of Acts 16. Therefore, sailing from Troas... We ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day we went out to the city of the, to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. And now there was a certain woman named Lydia that heard us, and she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she, had, she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the reality that it paints before us. God, there, your word says that narrow is the way that leads to life. And many will reject it. Many will refuse it. But Lord, there are some that will accept it. There are some that will choose to walk the narrow path. And Lord, that's a promise to us as your children that, that we should continue telling the story and reaching out because we never know who it is that might receive. So Lord, I pray you encourage us today. Speak to our hearts. And God, we ask in your name. Amen. I mean, you may be seated. So I would ask you a question as we begin this morning. Can one person really make a difference? One person. Like, can one person make a difference in anything? Oh, nope. history says yes. Uh, Thomas Edison, one person in, invented the light bulb, right? And we have all these wonderful lights now because of one man, Thomas Edison, who failed many times, in fact, before he actually was successful, if I understand it right. So Thomas Edison was a man who, who was uh, one man who made a difference. Albert Einstein would be another man. The, his, what is it, theory of relativity. Now, I don't understand it, explain it, but I know it makes a difference. Albert Einstein and his genius. There was a man, a president of the United States named Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln made a difference in this nation. One man made a huge difference in the history of an entire nation. So the question is, can one man make a difference? One, can one person make a difference? The answer is yes. One person. God can use one individual person to make a huge difference. In, in a city, in a family, in a nation. I mean, who knows? There's no, there's no stopping what God might do. This morning, I want us to study a lady named Lydia. 
And then we're going to expand and see a lot of other people as well. But Lydia is, is what mission strategists would call a person of peace. Now, that we're, I, we're going to study a person of peace, and I'm going to try to explain that. But what I want you to know is, is don't hear this as, oh, this is just for missionaries, and it doesn't apply to me. Because as we go through this and you hear what the mission strategists call a person of peace, I want you to know you can be that person of peace. You can be the one that God uses to change a huge community. You could be that person. And so let's think about a person of peace. And I want you to know that you can be that person of peace. Lydia is going to be an example of a person of peace. Now, what is a person of peace? Well, I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 10 because Jesus is the one that initiated this. Jesus was sending out his 70 disciples in Luke chapter 10, his 70 messengers. And here's what he told them. I'm going to begin in verse, verse 2 of Luke 10. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, nap, knapsack, sandals, and greet no one along the road. But here's what he said. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Remain in that house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you. Heal the sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter, and they do not receive you, go out in the streets and say, The very dust of the city uh, which clings to us we wipe off against you. And he gives these instructions to his disciples. So what Jesus says is, Listen, I, I want you to go into a city, and I want you to carry the gospel with you. And when you go, you start knocking on doors and you will eventually find somebody, a person of peace, who will welcome you and you will be able to stay in their home. You can share the gospel with them. And from that place, you, you go and you evangelize throughout the city. But he says there will be a person. Notice he also said there's going to be some who reject. There's going to be some who refuse to even listen. And Jesus told those 70 to just shake off the dust of your feet. And that was just symbolic of, uh, of you know, I'll have nothing to do with you anymore. You're, you've rejected me, and so I'm not, I'm not going to pursue anymore. I'm going, to, I'm going to continue to minister to those who are willing to hear. But so Jesus initiated this, this person of peace. We find it all the way back here in, in Luke. This person is, is going to be someone who's willing to hear the gospel. Now that, that's you. You're, you're sitting here and there was a time in your life when you were willing to hear the gospel. So I, I, again, I want you to know that you've, you fit this category. You can be the person of peace that makes a difference in other people's lives. But as a missionary, when they go into a city, they're looking for at least one person that's willing to hear the story. And what they do is they find that one person who's willing to listen. And they share with that person, and they talk to that person, and they answer any questions that person may have. Now, that person is, is hopefully going to be a person of influence. It may be that they have a reputation, and it's okay if it's a bad reputation. Whether it's a good reputation or bad, it doesn't matter. The, the, the matter part is that they know a lot of people, and they have influence on a lot of people. And so as God leads, the missionary will go and they will try to find someone who is the head of a household, the head of a clan, the head of a tribe, or whatever it may be. And if they can win that person to Christ, that head of the household, then all these other people will be influenced because of that one leader. Now you may be that person. You may be the, the leader in your home. You may be the leader of your clan. You may be the matriarch, the patriarch of your, of your household. And all those other people that, that, that look up to you, what a difference you could make in their life as they see you committed to Almighty God. And so this is what our missionaries do. They go into a city, they go into a new place, and they're looking for somebody's heart who has a heart that God has already been working on and already been preparing. Next week, perhaps we're going to study the parable of the souls, the, the, the four different souls, the sower. 
And, and I started to do it last week because it would have went with what we were talking about being receptive to the Word of God. But, but next week we're going to be talking about sowing, so I saved it for next week. But in that parable, though, there's four different souls. One of those souls is receptive. It's called the good soul. And what you and I have to understand is even though we may have rejection after rejection after rejection, there will be some who receive the Word of God. That's a promise from God. There's going to be those who will listen. There will be those who will receive. God has already been preparing their hearts and they will be receptive to the Word of God. Now, are there examples in Scripture of, of people who are persons of peace? All over the place. And I'm going to share two or three now, and then I'm going to share some more at the end of the message. But think about a man named Abraham. Abraham was a man who was receptive to the voice of God, and God spoke. What did God tell him to do? Abraham, I want you to get up, and I want to take your family, and I want you to take all your household. And you read Genesis, and it says everybody that was within his clan, they got up and they went to Haran. Abraham was obedient. He eventually would become the father of, of a nation. One man. One man God used to influence an entire nation. Abraham would be a, a person of peace. That is, he was willing to hear. What about a man named Joshua? The man Joshua who led Israel uh, to, to go and take the land of Canaan. Joshua says at the end of the book of Joshua, As for me and my house... We're going to serve the Lord. Now, did Joshua, how, much, how many people did Joshua influence? Well, the scripture says that until Joshua and all those leaders were, until they passed away, Israel followed God. They were faithful to God. Joshua made a huge difference. You could read all the different judges throughout the book of Judges, and you see that one man, one person, could influence an entire nation. We're in the book of Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 10 with me. There's a man in Acts chapter 10. His name is Cornelius. And Cornelius is a centurion, a Roman centurion. And he is one who is seeking after God. We're in Acts chapter 10, if you've gone back just a little bit. And the Bible says that about the ninth hour, verse 3, that he's, he has a vision from God. And Cornelius says, Lord, what is it you'd have me to do? And he says, send for a man named Peter. Now in verse 8, um, excuse me, verse 9, Peter at the same time is having a vision. And God says, Peter, there's some men coming from Joppa, and I want you to go with them. And then we're in Acts chapter 10 again. Let's go all the way to verse 24. The following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and called together his relatives and his close friends. Here's a man named Cornelius. He is a, an Italian Roman soldier. He's a centurion. He's in charge of a hundred people. God begins moving in his heart and life. And he sends for Peter because that's what God tells him to do. So Peter's on his way, and what does it say in verse 24? That, that Cornelius gathered all of his household and everyone that he knew, and he brought them to his house so they could hear the message that Peter was going to share to them. Here was a person, it is a, a, a person of peace. We could go to Luke chapter 5, we don't have to do that, but let me tell you about Luke chapter 5. There was a man named Matthew, and Matthew was a tax collector. He was hated by a lot of people because he was a tax collector. But in Matthew chapter 5, Christ came into his heart and, and the scripture says in Luke that, that Matthew invited all of his tax collector friends over for supper. And then he had Jesus come and share the message with all those people. You see, the person of peace is somebody who has come to the place where they know Christ personally. And they want everybody else within their realm of influence to know Jesus as well. And they're willing to tell and they're willing to share and they're willing to do whatever it is it takes to get people introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're back in, uh, in Acts chapter 16. I want to go back and show you that Lydia... Lydia is a person of peace. She is one of these people. It doesn't have to be a man. It, it can be a, a dear lady or it can be a teenager or it can be even a child, if you will. That someone who has fell in love with Jesus and says, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me and I want other people to know 
what He has done in my life. In Acts 16, verse, uh, verse uh, 11, we, we've just read this. But so, let's, let's remind you of the story. Paul has been led of the Spirit of God. He didn't get to go to all these other places uh, in verses 6 and following. He received the Macedonia call, if you will. And so when they get to Philippi, there's not even a synagogue there. There has to be at least 10 Jewish men to meet together to make a synagogue. There's not even 10 Jewish men, so they go to the riverside, which is the place of prayer when there's not a synagogue. When they go to the, to the riverside, they find a group of ladies, and one of them's name is Lydia, and they are there praying. Lydia is a Gentile. She was a Jewish proselyte. That is, she was a Gentile who is now worshiping God uh, by the Jewish faith. But they don't have a rabbi. They don't have a Levi. They don't have a priest. They don't have anybody. So they simply gather and they pray together. Paul finds them, and we, we find that uh, around verse 14. Now, there was a certain woman named Lydia who heard us, who heard Paul's message. She was a seller of purple, the city of Thyatira, and she was worshiping God. She didn't know Christ yet, but she was one who was seeking God. She wanted to know truth, and so she was there. She was a wealthy lady, a seller of purple, and so she's going to have a great influence. She's going to have a, a lot of people that she will be able to speak to, tell. Now, Paul didn't know he was going to run into Lydia there. All Paul was doing was following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit led Paul to this riverside. He shares the gospel, and it says that Lydia was there. And in the second half of verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized. You see, Lydia had such an influence that when she came to know Christ, she told everybody else that, that was within her household, her realm of influence, and every one of them were baptized as well. And not only that, it says that Lydia insisted that they stay at her home. It says she persuaded us. Most, most uh, teachers, I guess you would say, they believe, most people will teach that Lydia's home was the very first church in Europe. See, this, Macedonia is Europe. So Lydia this person of peace, her home became the first church of Philippi, which is Europe. Who would attend there? Well, Lydia and her old household. We're going to see in just a minute that, that the Philippian jailer and his whole household were saved. In Acts chapter 16, there was a, a, a slave girl who was demonic possessed that kept following them around. And Paul finally exercised the demon. She could have went to church there with them. And then anybody else that they may have, they may have won to Christ. All of a sudden, we have a church because one person came to know Jesus. Now listen, you can be this person of peace. You do not know who it is that's going to be this great influencer. But everybody needs Christ. Everybody needs to know Jesus. And so I simply go and tell my story. And, and if somebody's willing to listen, then that means God has already been preparing their heart and they may have questions. Well, wonderful. Answer those questions to the best of your ability. Here's what I know. Here's what God has done in my life. You see, witnessing is not that hard. You don't have to have the whole Bible memorized. You don't, you don't have to have a, a set plan. of. It's, it's okay and it's wonderful if you do. But if you will just tell your story, here's where I was at. I, I, I was a person who was miserable. I had done everything that I could do to find peace, and it was not there. But there came a time when, when a friend of mine told me about the Lord Jesus and what a, what a difference Christ made in his life. And I came under conviction. I felt, I, I felt within my heart that this is something I needed. And so I confessed that I was a sinner, and I asked the Lord Jesus to forgive me, and I've never regretted it one day since. It's the greatest decision I've ever made. That's all you have to tell somebody. Tell them your story. And then they may ask questions. Well, how did you know that's what you needed to do? You say, well, it was just, it was just something inside my heart. You know, I, I can't tell you. It was, just, it was just like God was speaking to me. 
And if God is dealing with their heart, they're going to say within their own self, you know what, that's what, that's what I feel right now. God is speaking to me as well. And you never know that that person might be the next Lydia. That person might be the next Joshua. Even if they're not, you have won a lost soul to Christ. You have won. You have changed all of eternity for somebody. The importance for missionaries, again, I, I kind of study this from a missionary standpoint, okay? So I'm going to share this part with you. But the importance of finding this, this person of peace is really a big deal for missions. But it goes all the way back to the Great Awakening. Back in the late 1700s, there was a man who actually started the Methodist Church, and his name was John Wesley. And John Wesley began being a circuit rider preacher. You know, you've heard of those guys, circuit riders, and they would just, they would go from one stump to another stump and they would preach. Well, John Wesley took Luke's account, Jesus taught, and he put that into practice. He would go into a, a little community where there was no believers, and he would start talking to people, and he would finally find somebody that was receptive to his message. And, and they would allow him to stay there. And he would win that person to Christ, and then that house became his preaching point. And he would make his circuit rider, and I don't know how often, but he would come around and, and he would go back to that house. And that household would tell all their neighbors, listen, the preacher's going to be here in two weeks, come listen to him. And that's how John Wesley began reaching people in a community. Well, after a little while, there was enough believers there that, that they would start a Bible study. They would have Bible study there on a weekly basis. And before long, that house would become a church. That's how John Wesley started the, the Methodist movement. That, that was his method. That's where the Methodism comes from. That was his method. The Great Awakening. And it was a great revival because John Wesley understood what Jesus had said. There are going to be people who make an impact. The mission strategists call it a domino effect. I can find that one person who has this great, great impact. Well, I can't just hand pick who I'm going to witness to. So what do I do? I just share with everybody that will listen. And I'm trusting that God's going to bring me in, into a relationship with the person that, that's going to make the biggest difference in that community. Now listen, there are probably people in our community right here. And we don't even know who they are. If I would simply just keep sharing my story, God's going to eventually lead me to that person that's going to receive Christ, number one. But then who knows, their family may extend way beyond what I have any idea. It may be that they, they have uh, lost friends that, that are galore. And you never know what one person might do. Listen, there's a sister church a few years ago. I got permission to share this. I'm not going to share any names. Uh, but there's a sister church that is, this is exactly what happened. There was one single person, one man, was one to Christ. And just, just a, a regular everyday encounter. I think it was intentional, but still, he wasn't the only one that was, had been, been witnessed to. But one man came to know Christ. And it turns out that that one man had a huge realm of influence. And all of a sudden, this church started growing. And it was growing, from my understanding, but not necessarily because of what the church members were doing, but this one lost man, when he got saved, he wanted all of his friends to know about the Jesus that he had finally met. And he himself, with some help, began reaching all of his lost friends. You never know what God might do in your heart. So how do we find these people? How do we find lost people in general? Well, it starts with prayer. We're in Acts 16, if you go back up to, to really the first 10 verses, the Apostle Paul. Remember, Paul had a plan. He wanted to go into this, this area, and, and the Spirit of God would not let him. So he wanted to go in this area, and the Spirit of God would not let him. And finally, the Spirit of God, he heard the Macedonian call. See, he was, he was in a relationship with God where he could hear the voice of God. We pray. We read God's Word and we listen. And we trust that God is in control of all things. And He's going to work things out. And, and I'm going to have some divine appointments 
where God is going to make it, where I'm going to run into somebody that needs to hear the story of Jesus. And they're going to say some kind of little question. They're going to ask something. And it may not say, and it may not be, oh, listen, would you tell me about Jesus? It won't be something like that. But they may bring up something about faith, something about your faith. Well, that's God's, that's God's opening up the door. It, it, may not be, it may not be a flashing light, but, but they, are, they will say something that indicates to you they're searching, they're looking. Now, I would remind you, Paul, whenever Paul would go into a new city, where did Paul always go first? Where did he always go first? He went to the Jewish synagogue. Why did he always go there? Because those people were, were searching for God. Now, they, they may have been legalistic, but they wanted to be in a right relationship with God. They may have done it in a different way. They didn't, they didn't follow grace. They had to learn about that. But they were seekers, if you will. They were seeking the truth about God. And that's what you and I are looking for. We're looking for people who will be receptive. They are already interested in finding out the truth. And again, they may not ask all kind of detailed questions, but they may ask the one question that you needed to hear to, to let you know, yes, they, this person is interested. Notice what we do uh, in, uh, in, in Acts 16. Paul leads them to the Lord. If we go all the way over to verse 40, uh, at the end of the chapter, Paul Paul has, has already experienced the Philippian jail, been in prison, and all that has happened. He's been released in verse 40 of chapter 16. It says, so they went out of the prison. They entered the house of Lydia. They go back to Lydia's house. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Listen, part of what we have to do once we win somebody to Christ is discipleship. We have to learn, help, help them grow in the Lord. And, and Paul would do this. Paul would always go back to the churches. Go back to where he had led people to Christ. And he would make sure they were growing. He would make, he would make sure there was a Timothy there or, or an Apollos there or, or Priscilla and Aquila. He would make sure there was somebody there to help them to grow. He didn't just leave them alone. And we have to do that as well. Listen, if you're a person of peace, then God can use you. God can use you to win others around you and then also to, to help them be discipled. God can do that, and God will do that, and God wants to do that. How do we find them? Listen, we, we look. We're constantly looking. We're constantly listening as God is moving us and leading us and guiding us. Our ears are open to hear that, that question that they might ask. And that's my indication that God is ready. See, it says here that Lydia, if we go back, Lydia was listen. She was willing to hear Paul's message. She was willing to listen to it. So where do we find these folks? Where do we find these people, of, of these persons of peace? Or where do we find these people that I can maybe win to Christ? Well, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're all around us. They're our neighbors. They're our co-workers. They are, they are the people that you run into at the lake when you go to the lake. They're, they're all around us. Paul constantly was moving because he knew that there would be people that would receive the message. And that's what God had called him to do. He was constantly going. But here's something interesting. Oftentimes the people that, that are going to be receptive are in the middle of a crisis whenever they're willing to listen. Now you think about that. They're in the middle of a crisis in Acts chapter 16, we meet a man. He's a Philippian jailer. And the Philippian jailer is a man who has been uh, assigned the, the responsibility of Paul and Silas and all these other prisoners. And you remember the story. God miraculously shakes the walls with an earthquake. The doors open and the jailer assumes they have all fled. And Bible says that he's about to take his life. And Paul says, don't harm yourself. We are still here. See, he's in the middle of a crisis. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Now, how did he know anything about being saved? Well, Paul and Silas have been in that prison all night singing and praying. And he's been listening to their songs of worship and praise. And all of a sudden, this flipping jailer finds himself in a crisis. And he says, what must I do to be saved? 
And the Bible says that not only did the Philippian jailer, but his entire household came to know the Lord. Because of a crisis that was going on in his life, his personal life. Many times when people are going through a crisis, they're willing to hear what God can do. There was a young man in the book of Old Testament named Joseph. Joseph in his coat of many colors. And Joseph was sold off as a slave. And as a slave, he, he became Potiphar's servant. And there at Potiphar, all of a sudden, he is wrongly accused. And he gets thrown in jail, wrongly accused again uh, of something he didn't do. And finally, 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 God delivers him. Listen, he was willing to be obedient because he was in a crisis. And God delivered him from that crisis. And all of a sudden, Joseph made a difference for the entire nation there. There was a man named Daniel years ago. Daniel was the one who said, listen, I, I don't want to eat the king's meat. I want, to eat, I want to eat the vegetables that God has always told me to do. And, and he was willing to take a stand. And, and God used that one person, Daniel. He became second to only the king, similar to Joseph. And Daniel made a difference for all of that nation as well. You see, God can use one person. God can make a difference with one person. Paul himself would say in the book of Philippians, now he's writing to the church that we found in Acts 16. In the book of Philippians, Paul says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Oftentimes in the midst of, of difficult circumstances, God can move and God will move. And it may be that you have a neighbor that right now is going through a trial in their life. Now, you don't go and try to take advantage of that situation. You just be there. You love those people like Jesus would love them. And, and, and you, you share with them. And they will experience the love of Christ in your heart and life. And they will ask you, what do you suggest I do? I don't know where to go, what to do. Help me. And there's your, there's your door. There's your opportunity. Well, I trust God. My, 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 my rock and my source of strength has been Jesus always. There's your door. So you know your family members, you have family that's going through hard times. Be there for them. Minister to them. And God will open that door. And you'll know it's time. It is time for me to share. Now be sure of one thing. Don't just, don't just tell them your story. At some point you have to press them to make a decision. It's not enough for them to know that you're a believer. That's wonderful. But at some point you have to press them that they need to make a decision as well. They must become a believer. They must invite Christ. And, and we, we can't fail there. At some point, we have to push the issue just a little bit. Are you, are you willing to give your life to Christ? Do you, would you like the peace that I have in my life? It only comes when you surrender your heart and life to the Lord Jesus. That's the only time, way you can find it. See, and we, we, have to, we have to push just a little bit uh, for a response from them. So what is, it, what is it difference does it make? What's the results if I, if I witness to one person? If, if I will just allow God to, to give me a divine appointment and I'm willing to be that person that, that God can use, what's the result? Well, it could be in a Philippian jailer and his whole household. It could be Lydia and her whole household. It could be the slave girl that was delivered from the demonic, which we didn't read, but it's in Acts chapter, chapter 16 if you want to read about her uh, that, that was delivered. It could be a new church is established in Lydia's home because you witnessed to that one Lydia. All kinds of things. In John chapter 4, we don't have to read this, but Jesus did this very thing. Jesus was at a well. A Samaritan woman came up and Jesus witnessed to her. And the Bible says she left her water pots and she went back into the town of Sychar. S-Y-C-H-A-R. I think I'm pronouncing it right. And she told everybody about a man who knew everything about her. And then before it's all said and done, an entire village comes to the well to hear Jesus teach and preach. Because one woman, one woman was witness to. 
We don't know the difference that one person can make. Listen, when God's people are faithful and obedient, and we simply live our lives as God asks us to live, and all we do is tell people what Christ has done in my life. All I have to do is tell them why I love Jesus. And He will open those doors. But when we are obedient, things change. God moves and people's lives are saved. Listen, I don't know if you would agree with this or not. I don't know how you couldn't agree with it, but I'm going to make a statement about our nation. Our nation is in dire straits. We are in big, big trouble. Now, I don't know if you agree with that or not. I think you have to. But we are in a mess. We need God's people, God's church, to start living as God would have us to live. We need to start living by faith. We need to be faithful to Him. We need another great awakening in America. There's been two over history that I know of. There's been other revivals, revival, true revivals. But America needs revival. We need the church to be the church. We need it desperately. America needs that. Or we're going down a slippery slope that's, that we do not want to continue going down. And it can start with one person, that one person that God knows, getting his heart and life to Christ. It's one person being saved. My job is to simply tell anyone and everyone God gives me an opportunity to. I don't have to go looking like the missionary does. I don't have to go into a village that, that's totally lost and find the influential person and win them. I don't have to worry about doing that. But what I do know is this. If I will be faithful, God will lead me to those people anyways. And eventually that person that, that can reach our whole community will win to Christ. Eventually that person that will make a difference in the state of Alabama will be won to Christ. Eventually, God will lead someone to, to, to one of these politicians and they will surrender totally, wholeheartedly and they will be able to make a difference. The church is the one that needs to make the biggest difference, though. We must, we must become the church. So here's my challenge to you. Would you ask God to make you a person of peace? You're already saved. But do you know what? You already have a realm of influence. There are people that you know. There are children and grandchildren that you have in your life. There are next door neighbors. Some of you may still work. There are co-workers. There are people that God can use you to make a difference in their life. Would you simply say, Lord God, use me. God, I want to be that person. Give me ears to hear when you speak. Show me the people that I need to be uh, witnessing to. God, give me the boldness and the confidence, trust, the faith that I need. Let me open my mouth, God, and you use me. Would you ask God to do that today? I believe one person can make a huge difference. And you can be that person. I'm going to ask you to stand. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to pray for us today. <clears throat> and I'm going to pray for you that God will give us that, that desire, that hunger to be what He would have us to be. That I would be the next Daniel. Or that you would be the next Lydia. Or, or you would be the Philippian jailer. And the entire household comes to Christ because of your witness. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and, and Lord, for the encouragement it gives us. God, we live in a world today that is, is very quickly abandoning you. God, we confess that to you. Lord, it breaks our heart that our nation is one of those that have turned their back on you. Lord, we confess that to you today. And God, I just pray that, that you would use your people, your church, Lord, uh, to make the difference that our nation needs, that our communities need. Lord, I pray that every one of us would, uh, would commit ourselves to being a person of peace. Lord, that we would be the person that's willing to, to share with our neighbors. That, that we would be the one willing to open our home up if needed to have a Bible study. Lord, we would be the one willing to, to tell a seeker, Lord, somebody that's wanting to know the truth, 
that we'd be willing to tell them what Jesus did for us. God, it's that simple. So, Lord, move, we ask. Speak to our hearts. Convict us of our sins. Lord, give us boldness. Give us boldness, Lord, to trust you. And we ask and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.